I will conduct a series of lectures that will be on the select methods in MAGIC with some examples, explanations, elucidations and so on. What is most important in the art, philosophy of Magia? First things first, it is the ethos, the discipline, the principle of the person concerned. Why is it so? It has a reason. Because when things get messy, when you are exposed to very nasty realities, you need to have a strong spine, strong nerves and plenty of strength and perseverance to survive. If you don't have a spine and a trained ethos, well bad luck, you'll probably break. So it is extremely important to strengthen yourself in the very first phase of training. This chapter is called Methods in Magic 1, Pythagorean Training. You ask for a method, my friend. The method is in you, in hard work, a deeply lived life and unban unabandoned visions. Paraphrasing Master Getter, you yourself are the learning. When the finger points towards the moon and you discover the secrets of the universe, even if you don't and you think you do. At the very end of the journey, the finger points back to you, questioning you whether you know thyself. Who are you? Whence? And to whence and to fro are you going to? Towards what? That was written in the day and hour of Jupiter. <clears throat> Like in sheet music for a symphony, every method in magic is a separate line of mentalese notion. Mentalese meaning noted by the mind. That should be harmoniously arranged with others. It is not merely the utility of the act, but its aesthetics, simplicity, virtuosity, inner composition and beauty. Not a single magical symphony may be repeated due to the complex factors and variables at play. It is improvised a vista with each ceremony, ritual, act and performance. Some rites may be performed repeatedly, but it doesn't mean that they will work always. It is hermeticizing the technique. It is simultaneously composed, conducted, played out and enacted. Similar to generating ingenious ideas with breakthroughs and moments of realizations, ecstasy, silence and equipoise. The process of magical symphony is employing the whole of humaneness and love follows humaneness to the highest possible effort for reaching the greatest ground of metaphysics in the sphere of magician's performance. Magic is a performative intellectual sport of highly pitched senses and trained apparatus of exe homo that requires no flatterers. It should be as natural as a homage accepted by an emperor that no regular man would stand, blushing and shying away, suspicious of the situation, sensing some deceit or simply, simply being afraid. You may encounter various spirits along the way. You may see them, you may not. You may feel their presence, you may not. You may sense how they interact with you in a tactile manner, visual manner, auditory manner, and so on and so on. The trap here is that you may be relegated either to psychiatry or religion. If you know how to stand it and persevere, if you are patient and disciplined, you may control the situations. What is more, by interacting with the spirit, you may be honored or you may be disproved. You may be loved or you may be hated. There may be an affect or there may be a complete malicious intent towards you. Now the quality of discernment is very important here. As we do not have astral ideas, the identity cards of every entity that we encounter with its nature, its abilities, what it wants from us, what it wants from it, what we want from it. In other words, there are multiple natures that are completely disinterested in the human world, that are doing their own business, like animals, 
like the spirits of the low, medium and high purpose. They go about their own business. And if a human notices them, they may be interested or disinterested in interaction with the mortal human being. Indeed, we receive both homage and inspiration from various worlds that others undreamt of, yet all for the sake of duty, beauty and destiny, as it unfolds and plays out to its utter completeness. Attempt but once reveal your successful walk into the vast majority of humanity and you will be laughed away and mocked. The reasoned will skeptically discard you. The naive will listen with interest to no true effect. The fools will attempt to claim the same. The fraudulent will employ charlatanly to emulate for the sake of gain, not successful in other than profit. Yet the hardest ordeal is to be alone with the alone, truly solitary in the world of men, in a crowded invisible world that others relegate to fantasy. Be prepared either for a great company or complete alienation and misunderstanding. Or oh, madness, if your leg happens to slip and your mind will be thrown into a disastrous condition. Here, rallying all the finest things that we may conjure, evoke, invoke, focus, catalyze, conduct, contain and master, we stand for what we truly are. We show our honest true mask to the world. Mark of genius is the capacity to feel greatly and deeply to harness oceans beyond one's triple single mortal life, and to involve the beyond, the orchestra of living majestic torrent of platonic ideas, of the ontological forces, to a single point of concentration that scrupulously notes down the observations that in a Socratic irony may not be conveyed otherwise than by a crooked, insufficient medium that is a mortal being. Be it in writing, performance, science, musical composition, theatre, acting, engineering, or any discipline that needs passion, derangement, masterful self-control, training, great understanding, precision, and technical acumen. When you transpose a great masterful walk, a mere notation into the phenomenal human world, and elevate it back to the transcendent, the whole that encloses a man in perfection of the creative moment stands monolithically above the uncouth boorish ear, and only a figment of it may be heard by a trained sophisticated peer. Lastly, only those who let this symphony lead them back into the artist's magical focus may catch the starry thread that lifts an individual back to the genuine place from whence it stands. Poor art may be immediately captured inasmuch as it leads to garbage. It requires no effort or has very little to convey, for it is ultimately the creator that stands in front of his work as a forefront. On this note, when the creator is put in mind or understanding, even the inspiration of all gods, hellish glare, depths of Tartarus, and starry expanse of muses and divinity will not be able to inspire him sufficiently for him to remake it into anything of world. That is the preparation of vehicle of the vessel is important to train the mind, to acquire knowledge, acquire skills, to create a workshop, to meet the gods and muses halfway. A poor magician will never perform any taumaturgy. At best, he or she will be ensnared by their own delusions. At worst, captured and pocketed by a small cargo diamond that will create illusions in their heads merely to turn them into a plaything and watch how the poor idiots fall prey to their own bombastically inflated minds. When they become dangerous, they may make you insane, or even destroy your soul. The prime responsibility of the artist is thus to develop his workshop training skill coupled with experiential knowledge, that means knowledge acquired by the force of experience, not dry knowledge, living knowledge intellectual humility and learning so that his mind is sensitive and receptive enough to the silence of inspiration. Whether that will make anyone into a genius, that is a different issue. Great artisans and technical players are not necessarily marked by genius, and the genius is easily spoiled by pampering a lack of solid foundation in technical approaches. 
that should be improved and embedded throughout one's life. But the given earth is a byproduct of work. No matter how handsomely done, one should think that his genius gives fruition on the other side, posthumously, where the eternal imperfection is continued. We die absolute fools in the end, just in order to rediscover ourselves on the other side with the baggage that we have of either art and work or something spoiled and poor. Fixed with worldly affairs, one quickly loses the point of furthering his act. His art, his accentuated existence, and rests on laurels that were never received, verily. Yet, yet, how to achieve this method? For I indulge in theory and remarks for much too long. The first stage is the synergetic Pythagorean pitching of senses, which is a method similar to sense consciousness training in the yoga schools. This is a highly extended and perfected method of visualization for images held in the mental field, audializations for sounds held in the audio auditory field, tactilizations for haptic sensations held in the mental field, olfactorizations for scent held in the mental field, gustatory sensations, and taste. In other words, you need to train your senses, to refine your sight, to train your hearing to train your concentration to focus, disperse, disperse in several objects. For example, that enables you to bilocate, trilocate, quadrilocate in astral world. Hearing is very important. When your mental energy is tied with hearing, you can hear sharply everything, gathering with your concentration all of the conversations that a group even a large group of people may have and preserve them in their memories, tracing all the lines of the conversations and the dialogues that others are not aware of, and then plotting information about people, for example. Otherwise, if a malignant entity is trying to tie your concentration to hearing and you have an astral love in your head that feasts of your mental broadcast area and auditory core, then you may hear this larva subpersonality drilling your mind. You need to focus on tying it with energy, ejecting it and fixing your mind with sewing it back with energy. I've been infested by such things a long time ago and then I ended up in the psychiatric regime. Fortunately, I fixed myself with my own techniques in order to put myself back together. Now. The taste is also important. Your ordinary gourmet uh, person that likes his food, everything in moderation, nothing in excess. I was having illusions of tasting putrid corpses of homeless persons, of disgusting saliva of uh, homeless females, of smelling the scent of shit, although there was no proper source of it, of smelling putrid skin that was rotten under royal water or the acid that was caused by Vurdulachi vamps or the Vurdulax of Saturn, the atmosphere of Saturn is full of acid. So why all this? Because if you are trained enough, no illusions around you, no ordeals around you, will be impressive to you. The nightmares that you may see will be empty forms. The ugliness delivered by other senses from the other side to test you will be a perspective of an agori, something transient, something empty, something illusory without intrinsic existence. And while you are trained to withstand both pleasant and disgusting sensations, your senses sharpen. While you concentrate on preserving yourself during battles and wars, psi wars, magical wars, your will, ajna, strengthens. You have a solid rock-like concentration that may be used as a tool at will. Now the best training is being put into deep waters 
but with guidance. If a person undergoes the fiercest of experiences, the most difficult, disgusting, wretched, tormentful, but has a proper master or mistress that will guide him through the process, he will be trained. You cannot train someone without substance matter. You cannot train discipline without substance to gather the experience and extract the finest points in that man or woman. Now, what I engaged before was a mere enumeration, but at first extending the separate senses and focusing on each one of them propels into consciousness of the separate system. Focus on your hearing only. Focus on your sight only. Focus on your taste only. Now combine your sight with your hearing. You see the sound. Now it tastes. You taste the sound and see it. Now visualize a triangle. A triangle is tasted, seen, geometrized, heard, felt. So they should be treated as separate entities, senses, at first to delineate where they begin and where they end. When mindful enough, we may proceed to synergy, the combination of senses and mental structures to and train the gustatory, auditory, visual, olfactory, all this that I mentioned before. In whichever combinations you like, the training should be disciplined and progressive in order not to put your mind into chaos. And be forewarned, there are spirits and entities from the other side that will play with your senses, that will play with the combinations that you have. And you may damage yourself by this training if you don't know how to fix yourself. And you fix yourself by both apotropaic magic, building up defensive shields, and knowing how to return to your original state. The training must be purposeful, otherwise you will end up with psychosis or some other kind of a mental disease that will fuck up your mind. So. At all times they should be repeated and trained despite further progress. We can deepen them, we can pitch the senses to immediately perfect conditions and combine them at will, preserving a sound mind, again very important. There are dangers to developing strong sense consciousness, especially when the psychic energy is clogged in one of the arteries of senses. Or when a malignant entity abuses our training for the purpose of generating false illusory stimuli. Let us remember that sense consciousness training should be at all times tied tightly with focus and concentration training. Mindfulness or meditation. The sense consciousness should go where it is commanded, nor where the jumping monkey of the mind tells us to. Especially that our focus and concentration in the early phases of training may also be abused by external entities. Remember that even if you multiply intelligence by intelligence, toughness by toughness, shrewdness by shrewdness, ethos is important because if some malignant force will hit at the root of your intelligence, which may be benevolent, it will redirect it toward the worst things, the most cruel, wrathful, hateful things. And your intelligence will be used, not for the right, but for the wrong. Your reason, reason as such, can lead to most destructive havoc and the most great intellectual enterprises. Your every virtue, if something strikes it at its root, at its root may be turned into a vice, a clasha, a pollution. And you need antidotes, you need to equip yourself with antidota to every vice in order to moderately balance them. So this is the law of anantodromia, the pressure of dualities. Even the finest focused concentration and intelligence may be cut short by leverage at the root from an unfriendly entity. 
if it did not resolve itself in a transcendent uh, that operates in a different proportion and allows safe walk. The more we are swung left and right, the easier to exploit us. If we go into extremes, radical points, from a beginner state of that, then it is very easy to manipulate with the extremes, putting at us to the extreme points. That is why it is better to be moderate from the start, to be balanced from the start, and to guard the gates of senses and mind from the very beginning. Because once the weeds plant themselves in your mind, you may go moderate, hate, moderate, calm. It shouldn't work like that. It should be strictly here, within the balance. The easier to ingrain habits of radicalism on both sides of polarities, killing the middle. We don't want to become hardliners of two polarities. We should seek the middle ground at all times. If the middle is transcending the polarities, all the better. But that is a question of individuation, an experiential and cognitive phenotypization of the person concerned. When we master sense consciousness, we may progress to the Illusory generation process, at times receive illusions, at times create illusions. Remember that illusions, what you visualize, what you vibrate, what you create with your mind, with uh, how you direct this flow of energy, mental energy, it is all seen by the other side, by the spirits, by the dimensions. Every thought of yours, every dream of yours, Everything you project out, especially when you're a potent magician, is perfectly seen on the other side, by the dead, by the diamonds, by the spirits, by the ghosts, by the elementals, by the gods, by whomsoever you interact with. There is nothing hidden from this other side. The interpretation of your produces in the world may be different amongst different spirits. And human souls and so on and so on. But remember that there is nothing that is hidden. Now, privacy is something that is reserved for people amongst a civilized society. But the other side knows. Surveying the surveyor. Observing the observer. So, as a consolation, even if you are stripped of privacy, in the modern days, by surveillance, by gathering information, the other side observes the observers. They know everything about agents, agencies, dark ops, psyops, the people registered as magicians in the grids, flying with their souls through the tax fair. That is all like an open book. And if you guide yourself correctly and rightly, you have nothing to worry about. Because if some of those mortals may act against you, that's their problem, not yours. When we master sense consciousness, we may progress to the illusory generation process to visualize and subtle material objects. Sounds at all. In the etheric realm, we may visualize a triangle that tastes like an apple, smells of gasoline, and sings My Way by Frank Sinatra. That is a simple technique. Yes, it is preferred to create things within one's own aesthetics. And the old adage goes, you are what you eat, what you consume with your senses, with your mind. You become like that. Remember, it's not about food. The food of your mind, the food of your senses, is what you essentially become. If you eat beautiful things, consume it, the aesthetics, the greatness, you become a more resplendent human being, a more human human being. If you eat indigestible feces that the modern world produces in pop culture, by and large, you become like it. So, that's your own choice, as I don't meddle into your preferences, but it has long-term consequences on the karma or your inclinations. 
because if you become something you are inclined towards something else. Just inhibiting oneself completely in chaos is only as good as you may reintegrate into something useful later, otherwise it's a terrible mess. That's why ordo ab cao. You must create an order, even if from chaos, because there is a natural human limit, cognitive limit, biological limit, soul limit, heart limit to certain things you may handle that you may not. Experimenting is nothing bad, but being prepared is of prime importance. You don't walk into a lion's den for experiment to see whether the lion will eat you or not if you don't know how to fight, how to calm the lion and how to withdraw if the lion wants to tear you to shreds. That's simple. Thank you.